Hi, I'm Bruce Cooper. Welcome to episode four of Highway 28. Today I'll be showing a video of Dr. Thomas Seafried discussing the possibility that cancer is a metabolic disease that can be treated with a low carb, high fat, or ketogenic diet. In the first three episodes of Highway 28, I've sh I think we've seen that there are many benefits potentially for a low carb, high fat diet for Americans. Cancer, however, seems to be approached as a genetic disease by most of the research, and the dietary approach advocated by Dr. Seafried seems to be ignored in the discussion. Perhaps it shouldn't be. Here's the video. Great. Um, thank you very much, Tom, for that nice introduction. I'd also like to uh, thank Ken Ford for the invitation uh, to come down here and, uh, and present a talk on some of our uh, recent work involving uh, cancer. Um, so I have the slide here, Cancer and Metabolic Disease uh, with Metabolic Solutions. Um, Having worked in the area for some number of years, it becomes clear to me, I think we have a path uh, to manage better this disease than the path and the approaches that we are currently on. Um, I start with, I know you might not be able to see these numbers clearly, but that's not that important. Um, these numbers are the, what I have here is a question for you all to think about, but I've also broken down from the American Cancer Society data on um, cancer statistics, new cases, deaths per year, and deaths per day. And I have this in my book, and I keep adding every year uh, the idea, you know, when, when is this going to change, okay? Now, um, if you look at the numbers, they're quite sobering, okay? Uh, but people look into these numbers and see uh, um, significant uh, advance. And the advance that they see is that the number of deaths, the increase in deaths per year, is not, this increase is not as fast as the number of new cases. And based on that, they say we're winning the war on cancer. Um, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm not going to say, you, you can choose, you can make the decision. Now, the, the other issue is, of course, you know, with, with uh, 1,500, 1,600 people a day dying from cancer, people, I, they know this is a problem, but can you imagine if we had 1,500 people a day dying from Ebola? Uh, think of it, it would, be, it would lead to a national panic. But yet, in cancer, it, it seems to be uh, kind of, I don't know if you want to say it's accepted or just this is the way it is. Well, I, I, I think there's a, there has to be a change here. We're spending billions of dollars on this disease, and the, the, the incidence continues to increase, and so do the deaths per day. All right, so, so what, why is this? Okay, what's going on here? And it's my view that we have misunderstood what the nature of this disease actually is. And this is what I'd like to focus on, and I'd like to provide you with data, uh, evidence, to show what we think the disease is and, 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 what, and what the disease really is. So the provocative question is, cancer a nuclear genetic disease or a metabolic, mitochondrial metabolic disease? Very important, because the answer to this question will change the way we uh, uh, study the disease and the way we uh, try to manage uh, the disease. So uh, what in, in today, uh, the academic and pharmaceutical industries view cancer as a genetic disease. And this is what we call the dogma. This is a belief, uh, an unshakable belief is a dogma. And uh, this paper, Hallmarks of Cancer, the Next Generation by uh, uh, Hannah Hannah and Weinberg, is one of the most highly cited from their previous and their current papers. This is cited many, many times because this sets out the dogma as cancer is a genetic disease. And when I say it's a dogma, it, 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 because I teach biology at Boston College, and all the books on biochemistry, cell biology, biology, they talk about cancer as a genetic disease involved with uh, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes and this kind of stuff. It's in all the textbooks. Our young people are indoctrinated into thinking and studying cancer as a genetic disease. It's the fundamental basis 
for the pharmaceutical and academic industries in their grants and in their approaches and things like this. Is that, is that right, though? So, and this is a textbook, what we show in the textbooks that you'll find in, in, in college textbooks. Uh, they, they, they look at this as, well, here's a car, the, 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 the pedal is to the metal, and the, the brakes are off. Okay, so this is basically a, a situation where the, they're looking at these cells as being completely dysregulated because they, they can't stop growing. So the, the key thing about cancer is this cell division out of control. And then we look at the proto-oncogenes. These are, uh, people have won Nobel Prizes for this. Mutations in these genes uh, uh, lead to various kinds. You get multiple copies, mutations, and rearrangements. And what it basically does is it stimulates these cells to, to grow faster and uncontrolled. These, these oncogenes derive from proto-oncogenes. Tumor suppressor genes prevent uh, 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 prevent uh, tumor, uh, uh, tumor genesis. So here is a normal tumor suppressor gene. It produces a product that keeps these cells in check. Uh, you can see they they're, they're have an appearance of not growing too fast. But if you have a mutation in that suppressor gene, then all of a sudden these cells start to... They, they, you don't have a control over them. And the, and the signature feature is uncontrolled cell growth. So it's a combination, uh, according to the dogma, it's a combination of here's a normal cell and you, and you have normal chromosomes and on those chromosomes are genes and then all of a sudden pop, you get a, a somatic mutation here, a somatic mutation there. You get a few more somatic mutations and all of a sudden this cell becomes a malignant cell and then you have to use all kinds of treatments. And this person you know, uh, is, one of, uh, is an individual now part of the, part of the system uh, involved in personalized therapies because she's looking at, a, at a, a, a readout of the gene mutations in this person's breast tumor and they're going to make a, a therapeutic decision by, by looking at all these different kinds of mutations and then they're going to say, okay, I can, I, if we use this drug or that drug or this approach or that approach, we may be able to target one of these different kinds of mutations and then maybe we'll be able to uh, you know, provide some sort of a therapy. Problem is every cell in the tumor is a different genetic entity, has thousands and thousands of mutations, no tumor. It's just a, it's a big hodgepodge from the, new, the genome projects. And then this one is, it, it's bad luck. Sorry, it's bad luck. And that paper just came out in Science last month, okay, from the Vogelstein group at, at Johns Hopkins. It's almost like a fait accompli. It, it's like, uh, you know, what do you, you, oh well, you just have bad luck and you're going to have these mutations, you're going to get cancer, and then we're going to try to treat you for this stuff. So, so we have this, and this is where it is. This is, the, uh, this is where it is today. All major medical schools are building departments of personalized medicine so we can screen all the mutations in the tumor cells that de develop very expensive drugs that often don't work very well and can harm you. But yet we're going forward with immunotherapies, all this kind of stuff. Evidence that challenges the somatic mutation. What, you mean to tell me there's no evidence, everybody is bought onto this dogma? Okay, why no one challenges? Why, why no one talks about the articles that don't support that? Let me show you some examples. Okay, this is a paper published in a top journal of science in 1969 from McKinnell's group. It's a, a tumor in a frog. It has a renal a, a kidney tumor. And, and uh, the frogs are good because we can do a lot of nice developmental studies on them because we, before we cloned Dolly the sheep, they did a lot of this work in frogs. So what McKinnell did was to ask, you know, what, what is the, t the nucleus of the tumor cell doing in, in controlling the, the growth of the tumor? So here's the, the, take the tumor out, you take the cell out of the tumor, and you take the nucleus out of the tumor cell, and you put it into a new cell of, of a fertilized egg. So this is a new frog fertilized egg, except the original nucleus was removed, and the nucleus from the tumor cell was placed into that egg. And you got a tadpole. And this tadpole looked for perfectly normal. There was nothing wrong with this tadpole. What happened to the oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes that were supposed to be responsible for the dysregulated cell growth? We don't know. But what's interesting is the tadpole didn't grow, it didn't develop into a mature frog. The, nu the mutations or whatever the defects were in that nucleus prevented further development. So there was an abortion or an abrogation, a blockage of further development. Now, this was a study done by, in another uh, powerful journal, PNAS, by uh, Beatrice Mintz, uh, who was one of the, the leaders in, in mammalian developmental biology. And she cloned mice from the nuclei of teratoma cells. And her conclusions were it's not possible that somatic mutations can be responsible. You got a mouse cloned from the nucleus of a tumor cell. 
If the nuclear somatic mutations are causing the dysregulated growth, how is it possible that you can, that you can develop a mouse or uh, clone a mouse from the nucleus of a tumor cell? Something is wrong here. And she said, that it's, it can't, it, it, structural mutations in the genome can't explain this. And this was a more recent paper by Jim Morgan's group at St. Jude's. They cloned a mouse from the nucleus of a brain tumor. All right? This was a medulloblastoma, and they implanted it into an embryonic stem cell. And this is the mouse embryo, you can see it here, but the germ layers, mesoderm, uh, ectoderm, endoderm, are all in their ordered uh, uh, places. There's no abnormal growth, okay? But the only problem is the embryos would only go to a certain point and then abort. There was something, these abnormalities in the nucleus of the tumor cell, they were not causing tumors, they were aborting development. Okay, so you have to go back and say, what is the hallmark feature of cancer? Dysregulated, disordered growth, driven by oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. We're not seeing that when we do these kinds of studies. And always, people always say, oh, these are, these are you know, uh, exceptions, exceptions, exceptions. Well, Rudy Yanish found the same kind of an exception. He cloned mice from the nuclei of melanoma cells. And he, was, he wanted to make sure his group wanted to make sure, how is it possible? What happens to all these mutations that are in the nucleus of the melanoma cell? Did they go away? So he takes the nucleus and puts it into a stem cell and clones this mouse, and he looks at the mouse and finds the same genetic mutations in this mouse that was present in the, in the, in the melanoma. But the, this doesn't have the tumors. So again, we're seeing this over and over. And then a more recent paper came out and showed that if you transfer mitochondria, non-cancerous mitochondria, the mitochondria I'll talk about in a minute, these are the little organelles inside the cell that generate the energy in our body, okay? But you can, you can completely shift the tumorigenic, the cancer phenotype, by moving these mitochondria around, regardless of what kind of nucleus is in there, whether it's a tumorigenic or a non-tumorigenic nucleus. These findings are incompatible with somatic mutation theory of cancer. So what, what we did then is we, I, now I only gave you a, a snapshot of, of many, many, many studies that I pulled together for the first time. And when you see these data for the first time, one after another after another, you say to yourself, what is going on here? Do the people who run the genome projects know about this? Well, oftentimes they ignore it. They don't discuss this. Now, what, now here it is. Okay, normal cells beget normal cells. Tumor cells in red beget tumor cells. What is responsible for this dysregulated cell growth? Is it the mutations in the nucleus, as the dogma would state, or is it something to do with abnormalities in the mitochondria in the cytoplasm, those little bean-shaped organelles? Because they're abnormal also in the tumor cell. These tumor cells don't have normal energy metabolism. So red cells, tumor cells beget tumor cells. So when you do the experiments, and you move the nucleus of the tumor cell and now put it into a normal cytoplasm, you get normal cells, you get sometimes normal tissue, and as I showed you, you can sometimes develop a whole mouse or a frog from the nucleus of the tumor cell, which is supposed to contain the mutations that drive the disease. And we don't see that. And if you take the nucleus out of a normal cell and put it into a tumor cell cytoplasm, you either get dead cells or tumor cells. There's something going on here. What's happening is that the, the normal mitochondria can suppress the formation of tumors, and whatever the gene mutations happen to be, they're not the drivers of this disease. Yet we're spending, we're, we're focusing on that. So if the somatic mutations are not the origin of cancer, where does cancer come from? How do we get cancer? Warburg had it pegged a long time ago in Germany one of the leading biochemists of the 20th century. Warburg said, cancer arises from damage to cellular respiration. All right? We breathe in air, we exhale. This is our respiration. Our cells, we respire. We are a respire. We respire, get our energy from oxygen. And we burn fuels. Cancer cells have defects in respiration. And then if they have the defect in respiration, they must compensate some way, and they ferment. Energy through fermentation gradually compensates for insufficient respiration. Fermentation is a primitive energy source that existed before oxygen came on the planet. Cells continue to ferment lactic acid in the presence of oxygen. Normal cell, if you hold your breath, your cells begin to ferment. You breathe and then you remove, the, you build up lactic acid and you get rid of the lactic acid. You exercise a lot, you can build up. The cancer cells continue to produce lactic acid even though there's oxygen present. Something's wrong here. There's a problem in their respiration. 
Enhanced fermentation is the signature metabolic malady of all cancer cells. Now, I showed you that picture of that woman looking at the screen, looking at the hundreds of mutations. Every cancer cell has different kinds of mutations, but they all ferment. That's, the, that's what they do, they ferment. Why we not focus on their abnormality that's common to all the cells rather than focusing on the defects that's present only in a few of them? Those are the questions people have to ask. Now, cellular energy metabolism. Um, this is a very simplistic diagram. I don't want to get into all the pathways. Most of the energy we have in our body comes from oxidative phosphorylation by breathing oxygen through the electron transport chain in the mitochondria of our cells. Now, we get a little bit of energy in glycolysis in the cytoplasm and a little bit of energy in this Krebs cycle. Cancer cells have less energy coming from oxidative phosphorylation and more energy coming from these more primitive forms of energy. This is the difference between the cancer cell and the normal cell. The common difference that we see, not the mutations, but this is the common difference. Now, here's, an here's a visual example of what I'm talking about. Mitochondrial morphology, a little bean-shaped organelle in the cytoplasm, is the energy source of our cells. The power plants in our cells are these little mitochondria. They're, they're laced throughout the cytoplasm in our cell. And then these little stripes, you see these little stripes, these bands, they're called cristae. And in those little bands contain the proteins and the lipids necessary for us to breathe and for our energy and our bodies to work. Here's a, a, a mitochondria and a glioblastoma multiforming. It's a human, very deadly human brain tumor. And you can see it's empty inside. It's called crystallysis, this breakdown of cristae. So the, the, the mitochondria in cancer cells have defects in the very structures needed for them to respire. There's no way that this organelle is going to be able to use oxygen efficiently to produce energy. So therefore, the cell to survive must ferment. And that's what these cancer cells are doing. They're all fermenters to one degree or another. Now, Pete Peterson at Johns Hopkins published a beautiful paper in 1978 documenting that there is no known tumor cell that doesn't have some defect, however small, in the, in the structure of these little organelles. So, based on that information and based on the information that I'm going to show you about how to manage some of these diseases, we put together, and I know this is a little hard for, for the people in the back to see, and it tries to encapsulate all of the observations, the majority of the observations that we see in cancer based on a metabolic underpin, okay? This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to show that if your hypothesis or your theory is correct, you should be able to account and explain the vast changes that we see in the disease, and we can. First of all, we have this oncogenic paradox, which has puzzled everyone from the beginning, the, the, the great minds and the thinkers. How is it possible that we can have so many provocative agents in the environment that we know cause cancer, cause the disease through a common mechanism, all right? So, for example, I mean, we, we have um, carcinogens, you know, we have radiation, hypoxia, inflammation, rare inherited mutations. People think cancer must be a genetic disease because I, got, I inherited a gene from my mother or my father and it gave me cancer. That gene product targets this, this little organelle, the mitochondria, and makes it inefficient. So that is a, the primary cause of the damage to this organelle. All of these different provocative agents will do that. Viruses, people know hepatitis C, papillomaviruses, they cause cancer. They cause cancer because they disrupt the energy metabolism in that organelle. And age, we get older. Older people are more prone to cancer than younger people because that organelle gets damaged with age. Now, what happens is when that organelle is damaged, it produces these reactive oxygen species, these are toxic byproducts of energy metabolism. And these ROS are both carcinogenic and mutagenic. They will damage the DNA in the nucleus, and they will further damage the energy metabolism in the, in the mitochondria. So these little ROS are produced from this plethora of disparate... Some people say, well, I don't know how I got cancer. I did this, I did that. I was, you know, it could be from any one of these things damaging that, producing these ROS. The ROS then damaged the DNA. In the new, so all the mutations and broken chromosomes and all these things that we see and that we're studying and we're spending billions of dollars on are downstream epiphenomena of the damage to the respiration. Now, what happens here is we have normal respiration and we have this old fermentation pathway. And as Warburg said, as the respiration becomes damaged from a chronic inflammatory, from smoking, from carcinogens or whatever, respiration in the cell goes down and the cell to survive must begin the fermentation. The red line goes up. The cells are compensating their respiration for the primitive form of energy that existed on the planet before oxygen came in, which is fermentation. Now, what's driving this? The oncogenes. 
these things that we're all focusing on. They are, the mitochondria signal the nucleus. We are insufficient with respiration. We're going to die if we don't get help. So what happens is the signals go to the nucleus, the oncogenes turn on. The oncogenes are transcription factors that increase fermentation energy pathways. All right? So this is an effect. It's a knee-jerk response to the damage of that organelle. Now you go back and you begin to put all the pieces of the hallmarks of cancer together, linked to the damage to that one organelle. And you can do that. I've done it, and it's very remarkable how you can count for all of the thousands of studies that are being done on cancer can all be linked back to this one common factor, which is damage to the respiration. So we've seen angiogenesis, avoidance of apoptosis. Apoptosis, if a cancer cell has defective respiration, it should be dead. And that's what happens. As Warburg said, if you damage the respiration too acutely, the cell dies, it can never become a cancer cell. But what we have here is we have avoidance of apoptosis. And then you have this metastatic issue where we have shown the our immune cells of our body fuse with these tumor cells and you have metastasis because these cells naturally spread throughout the body. I've published several papers on that. So if all cancers are a type of mitochondrial metabolic disease, then what therapies might be effective for managing the tumors? Calorie restriction is what brought us to the idea that, you know, what's going on here? A metabolic cancer intervention. It involves total dietary restriction, differs from starvation. People say, oh, Seafree does starvation studies. No, I don't. Cahill did starvation studies. Cahill, just, he's the world expert. He was before he, when he was, was alive. So, uh, cal calorie restriction is very therapeutic. You don't starve to death. People, some people say, oh, I haven't eaten for three days. I'm starving to death. You're not starving to death. You have to go, but my students tell me, I, I, I said, how long are you going to go before you, how, how long do you think you're going to live without eating? Oh, two days. So I, I, I said, you're going to be dead in two days if you don't eat? Oh, maybe I may think about that a little bit more. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to be dead. <laughs> so, so anyway, it maintains middle and newtons, enhance, enhances mitochondria. This is another thing. If you stop eating, the mitochondria, they go through this autophagy procedure. The mitochondria get broken down. This mitochondria is not working. Get rid of him. Put him in the lysosome. Re reconfigure his, his metabolites, and we're going to have new and healthy mitochondria. Woo! CR mimic. Now, don't forget. Now, oh, we do all this work in the mice. Oh, will it work in human? Well, when, when, you, when the human finds out what he has to do to make, the, to make it look like he's the mouse, I don't want to do this. So, uh, therapeutic fasting, what does that mean? Drink water for three or four days, maybe a week, and then I'll get the same benefit as this poor mouse? Now, the, the, the thing of it is, the be basal metabolic rate of the mouse is seven times faster than that of the human. It's unbelievable. These guys eat 25% of their body weight a day. You know, it's unbelievable. Humans are much more capable of dealing with these metabolic shifts than is the mouse. Now, when we stop eating, blood sugar goes down for the most part, most of us. Obviously, you're not eating anything. The brain needs sugar. The brain needs glucose. Oh, if we stop eating, today I should be unconscious, laying on the floor, writhing around. Well, what happens? How come I'm not doing that? Because we have, insulin goes down, glucagon comes up, and then you start mobilizing the fats after a couple of, you know, 36 hours, get rid of the glycogen. And we take the fats, and it goes to the liver, and the liver breaks up, it's like putting, it's like putting long logs of fatty acids into a wood chipper, out come these water-soluble ketone bodies, and they go to the brain, and the brain will burn ketones and glucose. So the ketones take the pressure off the fact that you're lowering blood sugar. This is an evolutionary, evolutionarily conserved adaptation to starvation. Otherwise, we would have been wiped out as a species. Humans evolved to starve. We can go long periods, I, long conversations with Cahill about how long people can go without eating and still be healthy. Starvation is a pathological state. It, 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 there's a period when th therapeutic fasting moves to starvation, which is pathological, and that's very dangerous. So don't think that you have to be very careful about this. Beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, these are water-soluble breakdown products of fat, and they are powerful energy metabolites that will allow our body to function at maximal energy efficiency, but you, only when the glucose goes down. Now, this is a diagram explaining a little bit how this might work to kill tumor cells, or at least arrest their dysregulated proliferation. So here we have this cell. Here's a blood vessel. Okay, all of our tissues have blood vessels through them. Okay, glucose comes into the cell and is metabolized through the glycolytic pathway to pyruvate, and it's fully oxidized. But the tumor cell, as I told you, this organelle is defective in the tumor cell. So consequently, the glucose, they, they blow out lactic acid. They convert pyruvate. This is a waste product lactic acid. It goes into the outside of the cell and creates an acidic microenvironment. 
This brings in, makes the immune system look crazy. Oh, everybody, the, the, the microenvironment, all these cells are coming in, secreting all these different kinds of factors because the cells can't effectively respire. So what we do is we lower the blood sugar, that's the fuel for this growing beast, and we bring in the ketones. The ketones are raised up, they come into the cell, they bypass this, they go right into the mitochondria. Problem, tumor cells have all these defects, they can't use the ketones. The normal cells in the brain are burning these ketones because we evolved to do that. The tumor cells are stumbling, staggering. This is a fuel they can't use because they're mitochondria defective. So what we do is we metabolically marginalize these cells. It kills a lot of them, but it doesn't kill them all, but it slows the whole process down. And we, 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 we actually showed, here's an example of a mouse that has a big tumor. And we just take away the food that he eats, restrict his food by 40%. And this is ad libitum, means the mouse eats whatever he wants, whenever he wants. You get a, and then we just restricted this, and you can see we got anywhere from a 65 to an 85% reduction in the size of the tumor simply by taking away, the, reducing the amount of food. And we also went on to show each little square is a mouse under a different diet condition. As glucose goes down, ketones go up. This is an evolutionary conserved response to the absence of glucose. As glucose goes down, the tumor size goes down. We, we were one of the first to show this, and many people now have shown this in all kinds of humans with different kinds of cancers. Brain cancer linked to sh blood sugar. It doesn't mean that sugar causes the cancer, but if you have the tumor, the tumor will grow faster with the higher blood sugar. The higher your sugar, the faster that tumor is going to grow because it's going to ferment the sugar, pr prime fuel for fermentation. Tumor, what are the, now, people say, well, what's the mechanism? What's the mechanism? You've got to show the mechanism. We showed the mechanism, okay? Anti-angiogenic. We showed insulin-like growth factors, signaling cascades go down, uh, AKT signaling goes down. We showed all this stuff. Anti-inflammatory. These drugs in the pharmaceutical industry, anti-angiogenic, anti-inflammatory molecules are big business. Nothing is as powerful as this calorie restriction in targeting those pathways. NF-kappa B pathway. Also, pro-apatonic. If you're going to kill your tumor cells, you want to make sure you're killing only your tumor cells and not the cells surrounding it. All right? And that you want them to die by their own self-suicide, self apoptosis. You want to kill them by the tumor cell dropping dead. You don't want to blast the whole environment and kill everybody along with the tumor cell. This calorie restriction and ketogenic diet restrictions kill these cells through a pro-apatotic mechanism, which is really nice. Star contrast to standards of care. Research question. Okay, what about GBM? We do a lot of work with brain tumors. We built some of the finest and best models of brain cancer that replicate exactly what goes on in the human brain. And here's an example of one of these models. So this is a, this dark blue material here, those are the tumor cells, and you put a few cells into this mouse's brain, and it migrates from one side of the brain to the other and goes to different regions very quickly, just like GBM does, the human GBM. We put the mouse under calorie restriction, and, and you can see, we don't kill the tumor completely, but we restrict a lot of its, if, if its invasion and migra migratory behavior. Very interesting. Now, the problem with calorie restriction is it's calorie restriction, the name itself. People have cancer. They're under a lot of mental stress. They're in duress. And now you tell the poor guy, well, you're going to have to stop eating for like three weeks. He doesn't want to hear that. Okay, so, so what we do is we can, we can achieve the same kinds of metabolic manipulation with these ketogenic diets. Now, what is a ketogenic diet? A lot of controversy. Oh, this ketogenic diet. What is a ketogenic diet? Well, basically, and this, they come in all sizes and shapes, and you've got to be careful. Okay, so it's basically a low-carbohydrate diet, high fat, a moderate protein. It gets a lot of energy per gram of food. Ketogenic diets, in my view, should always be consumed in restricted amounts anyway. But you know the interesting thing? The human brain, if you eat fat, you feel full, all right? A lot of people eat the fat, oh, I've had enough. Some, sometimes it's not always as tasty as you like it to be, and you just don't want to eat anymore because it doesn't taste good. But the issue is, and you get indirect calorie restriction like that. But the issue is, uh, it, it, there's hormones in our brain and our body that respond to this that give us a natural restriction of food. Now, people say, uh, here's, here's a mouse tumor and a human tumor to be compared uh, with growth under the calorie-restricted ketogenic diet. Now here's the unrestricted high-carb diet. Now here's a ketogenic diet where the mouse is not restricted. He eats as much as he wants. There's no change in the tumor, either the mouse tumor or the human tumor. It is only when we restrict the diet do we see the, the reduction in tumor size. Now this is very important. Blood glucose and blood ketones. People say, well, you're eating a diet that has no carbohydrates in it. You know, one or two percent, sometimes zero. How is it possible that you're maintaining high blood sugar when you're eating a diet that has no carbohydrates in it? Where's the sugar coming from? It's coming from the liver. 
If you eat too much fat, you get dyslipidemia, insulin insensitivity, and the blood sugar stays high. You've got to cut this down a little bit. Then once the blood sugar goes down, the ketones go up. Now look, at here's the guy eating all the ketogenic diet. Are you getting ketones from this? Yes, he's getting ketones. They're higher. But he's peeing them out. As fast as he's making them, he's peeing them out. But if you restrict the diet, now they stay in the bloodstream. And they stay much higher concentration. Now the important issue here is that ketones, if you can get them high enough, they will absolutely kill the tumor cells. Dom D'Agostino and I showed this, and so did several others. They act as histone deacetylase inhibitors. This is very interesting because the pharmaceutical industry has a big platform on developing histone deacetylase drugs to kill tumor cells. They're very toxic and expensive. You can do the same thing if you can get your ketones high enough, but you've got to lower that blood sugar. Now, here's the plan. You get your blood sugar down, you get your ketones up, and you get into this so-called zone of metabolic management, and we're trying to achieve that. Now, this is a very interesting picture of a dog with a big tumor on his face. Now, some woman from Georgia uh, read our papers, and our, looked at our videos and YouTubes, and she, her, she had this big dog, and it had this big mast cell tumor on his face. Here's his nose, and here's the tumor. And, and she said, I did what you said. I, I fed my dog. Uh, she get, went to the butcher, got organic chicken with the bone still in the meat. And she got a little uh, medium chain triglyceride oil, a little raw egg. And she calculated the size of her dog, how many calories the dog should eat, what should I do to restrict the 40% the, the calories. And uh, she, she gave the dog that. And, 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 and within a very short period of time, you can see the dates here, this tumor shrunk. The, vets, the, the vet said that you're going to have to have surgery, radiation, and chemo, and it's going to be expensive, and the dog may live only six months. So she did this on her own, without any training. And look, here's April, 20, uh, here's April 2014, and this she sent me the picture last, last month, 25th, January 2015. How's the dog doing? Doing fine. I mean, the dog, he should have been dead, right? So anyway, some vets came to my lab up at the Tufts New England Veterinary School. They had come to me a couple of years ago, and they said, hey, listen, we want to try ketogenic diets on the dogs. Oh, it's going to be tough, you know, they're saying to me. I, I told them what they have to do. We have to bring the dogs into the clinic, do all this stuff. So I showed her. I said, well, listen, here's something that might work. You might, guys might want to consider. So I showed her this, the, the vets up at the Tufts, and they said, whoa, this is really interesting, but we can't use this kind of therapy in our clinic. And I said, Why? And she said, we don't believe in feeding dogs raw meat. <laughs> I said, what? I said, the damn dog evolved to eat. What do you think? They were eating kibbles and bits in the forest? <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, we're up against a mindset here. When you, dis, when you take your brain and you put it into a different sphere, you can't see what goes on up or down. So, but there are people who are aware of this and they're going to start moving on it. Because I think if we can, cure, if we can manage these dogs' cancer, some, some guy may come to me, can you do that to me? You know, so I mean, it's, it, we're up against all kinds. You have no idea all the, all the firewalls that exist. Uh, can a ketogenic diet be effective in, in, in patients? What about people? Okay, Linda Nebling, now at the NIH, she took two little girls, hopeless cases. They were really in bad shape. You've got to read, if you, read the article. You'd be shocked at these poor, what they did to these little kids. Poison, the, the, to, the toxic drugs the kids gave them. It's just sad. It makes you cry when you read it. They were irradiated. They were surgically mutilated. They were all kinds of things. And then she grabbed them, put them on this ketogenic diet, and their quality of life came back. They, they, they started to interact with their friends. They went back to school. Now, they didn't survive. At least we don't. One was lost to follow-up. One lived much longer than, than was expected. But their quality of life increased dramatically when they were put on the ketogenic diet. And she lowered the blood sugar, and she elevated the ketones, just as we did for the dog and these mice. And the kids got the same kind of an effect. Everybody, oh, it's anecdotal. You've got to run a clinical trial and stuff. But, but I'm telling you, we've seen this in across the species. So, so anyway, we, 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 we designed a, a, a protocol. Now, we first had to characterize, yes, she has GBM, patholo pathological report. Now, here's the big tumor um, in the brain. It's a multicentric glioblastoma. These are the worst of the worst kind. I mean, these tumors are really nasty. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we got this. And then as soon as she came out of surgery, uh, we, uh, she went on a ketogenic diet, calorie restricted, therapeutic fast, water only, all this kind of stuff. We were able to bring her blood sugars down, her ketones up a little bit. And then we had an MRI several months after all this. Now, she was getting radiation and she was getting chemo. So not, not, ke not timazolamide, she was off the steroids, she was getting radiation. But we have here a tumor several uh, months later and we call this radiological resolution. You don't see any tumor in her brain anymore. And everybody was like shocked. Not that it doesn't happen. It happens very, very rarely. And maybe, maybe she's one of those rare cases. But we had several more like this over periods of months, and it looked like everything was good. 
So she, she was swimming in the Mediterranean. She felt good. Her quality of life was excellent. She gets off the diet, and then t- about two or three months later, the, the tumor comes back, and rather than going back on the metabolic therapy, she decides to go on Avastin, which is a big blockbuster drug in the pharmace- pharmaceutical companies. I said, don't use that. I, I've looked into Avastin. It's the worst of the worst drug. Never used it. The, the FDA pulled it off the market for breast cancer, but they haven't pulled it off for, for brain. Uh, the, ca- the, the tumor came back, and she died. So we learned a lot from this, and we learned what we should do. Then I said to myself, what's going on with the standard of care? So what do we do to people that have brain tumors? All right? So uh, I published a paper, and I was just so pissed off, and I never thought anybody would accept this paper for publication. But the Lancet Oncology, one of the top cancer journals, did publish it. I was, I was shocked, actually. So, so anyway, I, we drew this cartoon, my students and I. So what, here's you have this, this big tumor, and then the surgeon will come in, and he'll try to resect as much as he can. And then what happens is he can't get it all, and then they irradiate the remainder, and they cause the breakdown of all these uh, metabolites. Glutamine, as I said, is a powerful fuel for these tumor cells, and it comes as the result of creating this necrotic environment inside the brain. And then, then your head swells when you get radiation, right? So you get, you get dexamethasone. You get a lot of dexamethasone because you got a lot of edema in the brain, not only from the tumor, but from the radiation and all this other stuff. And, and this brings in glucose, high levels of glucose. So the two prime fuels that these tumor cells need to survive are provided by the standard of care. And not only that, they give you temozolomide, which even increases more of the necrosis and inflammation. And to make matters worse, these cells are all infected, most of them, not all of them, with human cytomegalovirus, which use glucose and glutamine and feed it into the the, the machinery of the tumor cell. This is the perfect storm of adverse effects Knowing what I know, I would never do this to anybody. This is the standard of care. Now, you want to see how it works? Okay, so let's look at the survival of standard of care. And this is the, the, the survival. Okay, so if you just take radiation by itself in this big trial, nobody survived. There wasn't a single zero. Now, what, here's the big breakthrough. Temozolomide, used with radiotherapy, gave us the first major advance in survival in brain cancer. I was at the, the, the talk when they mentioned, oh, this is the greatest thing. You can take it as a pill form. You don't have to be injected with it and all this kind of stuff. And we get a little bit of an increase in survival. You can see radiotherapy. with This is a major advance right here. So now what came out recently is a paper. Temozolomide increases driver mutations in the tumor tissue. I said, what's this? Okay, so driver, I just went through this big thing about cancer, all the driver genes, and everybody thinks this is what's causing the cancer. Now, what's going on here is you, is you, you give a drug, temozolomide, increases these so-called bad mutations that make it grow faster, should, but yet the people live a little longer. How do you explain this on the gene theory? Here's the gene theory. It's telling me if I have all these mutations, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, driver genes, why the patients are living longer when you give them the drug that increases these mutations? All right? So what, I said, look, what happens when a patient takes temozolomide? I gave it to some of my mice. It was like the worst thing I could ever imagine. Look at the mouse. He's like dead in three days. He's starving to death and everything. I said, what's going on? So, so I, I take this. I said, look at the, what are the patients? They get fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting. All of these things are secondary forms of calorie restriction. Do you think it's possible that this little blip in survival might be due to a, a, an independent effect rather than what they think it's doing? Now, who is going to run a clinical trial to test that hypothesis? So we, we've abandoned our thinking along those lines. We've come up with this concept of the press pulse paradigm, which I think, and Dom and a bunch of us, think is going to be a more, a, a, a more rational way to deal with this cancer. Now, will it work? I think so, but it needs to be proven. Now, what we're going to do is we have these cells in our body that are tumor cells, and they are filled with mutations, no denying that. We have done, listen, there's plenty of, when we take our body and we fast, and we go through these different scenarios, our cells earn the right to live in this body because we evolved over millions of years from all these other organisms. We are tough. Our normal cells can make these metabolic transitions because our genomes are, are, were, were, were evolved to do that. These tumor cells are loaded with mutations. When you do that, they, you have all these mutations. You saw how they block development. Well, they're going to block the transition from going from one, one state to another. And we think this is the way we're going to be able to manage this. We use a ketogenic diet to form a total press on the body, a mild metabolic stress that puts these tumor cells, makes them vulnerable. Then we come in with non-toxic drugs, and we hit them. 
We hit them, we hit them this way, we hit them that way, we hit them this way, as long as they're under the press. And we think we can do this non-toxically to keep people alive. Because we've shown it in the mice. When we combine certain drugs with the diet, we get synergy. The diet is the press, the pulse is the drug, non-toxic drug. Dom D'Agostino and his group, we published this showing systemic metastatic cancer. The blue is all these tumor cells that are lit up, and they're blue all over the mouse because they're spreading just like human metastatic cancer. Hyperbaric oxygen does a little bit. The diet does, of course, has some significant effect. But when you combine the two together, you get a synergy, non-toxic synergy. We just don't know all the right ways to do this yet or the dosage or the, or, the, or the best way and what state you have to be in, but we think we can perfect all that. This is another interesting. 25% of all cancer deaths come from metastasis from some organ to the brain. Okay, so we have the heads like, so we have this model, you put the cells in the flank and you can see the, the tumor cells go to the mouse's brain and the mice, this is just like human. We put them on these calorie restricted ketogenic diets and we significantly reduce the spread of the tumor from an organ to the brain. So we're able to show you do, how to do this. Now, the problem is, I'll just briefly mention this, people don't know if you have cancer, you don't know when you're in this metabolic zone. How are you going to do it? If you run a clinical trial, how do we know this? So we, my students and I developed the glucose ketone index. It's, it's ridiculously simple. You just divide glucose by the millimolar and ketone millimolar, you come up with a number. And what we found is the closer that number is to one or below, 1.0, you're in this metabolic zone that's putting a lot of pressure on these tumor cells. Okay, this gives the patient an opportunity to look at where he stands today. It's like somebody with, who has diabetes. They look at the, oh, look at my blood sugar's a little high, but it takes some insulin or better, it takes some metformin or something like this. You can, you can, patients now and their caregivers can now administer these kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, they can use this as a tool to assess their therapeutic efficacy. Now, what I did is I edited a big uh, series of publications uh, on ketones, not only for brain cancer. We're now realizing that these ketones have tremendous power to manage a number of chronic diseases like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injury. They reduce inflammation. They provide an alternative fuel to the brain and suppress a lot of the damaging uh, events that occur through aging or, or chronic trauma or, or acute trauma. And I, if, you, if you're interested, we're putting this together now. The academicians are starting to take notice of what's going on. A lot of this is in my book on cancer as a metabolic disease. I also want to bring your attention to the book that Travis wrote. Uh, he, Travis couldn't believe what I was saying in my book. He said, I can't believe this. So he said, I have to go out and talk to those geneticists and those scientists at these big universities and find out what, what do they think about all this. And, and he came away with the, he said, these guys are, these guys are lost. These guys who are doing these genomic studies. They can say everything can be anything and it's opposite. Th there's no rhyme or reason to any of this stuff. Yet we're plowing ahead with billions of dollars. So he wrote a book for the layperson, more or less like, a, like a, a journalist, going around getting personal. He wants to talk to the scientists that did the work or how they feel about it. It comes out very interesting. So in conclusion, preclinical and case report studies indicate that the restricted ketogenic diet can be an effective non-toxic metabolic for, ch for children and adults and that this therapeutic can be enhanced if we combine it with the press pulse paradigm. These are non-toxic approaches. I can't tell you whether it's gonna be the solution to the cancer problem, but I can tell you I think it works and it's not gonna hurt you. And it has the potential mechanistically to be very effective. Now, a lot of my collaborators at different universities, a lot of physicians and basic researchers, uh, Dom is here, you know, Joe Maroon at Pittsburgh, t team surgeon for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I mean, we have, we have a number of people that are, are gathering together that are basically outraged about this cancer situation, and they want to do something about it. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yes, questions? If somebody currently has cancer, is there any kind of uh, ketogenic protocol or diet that they should follow? Yes, the question is, do we have diets and protocols? And the answer is yes. Uh, there are a number of new books that have appeared. Uh, people, the caregivers themselves are writing these books and they have a lot of first-hand experience with themselves or with their own family members. And they work 
a lot of times uh, they'll work on the phone as a consultation service and they'll get you in touch with certain physicians that know how to apply this. Unfortunately, they're few and far between. You won't often find them at the top medical schools, unfortunately. So we're waiting for the... Well, we find them by the... You, can, you consult the... You, there was phone numbers and I have lists of physicians that I give in these packets that I hand out to the... Because I have over 1,000 emails from cancer patients. And I, I'm not a physician. I can't administer medicine. I can't do that. But what I can do is put these people in contact with those who know how to do this. And that's what I try to do. Yes. Uh, I... Thanks, Ed. Uh, doctor, I sell hammers. And I am a long, long way from the technicalities and the science you've just described. But to me, listening to you, it's inarguable or unarguable. Could you just for a moment switch feet and give me some arguments to disprove what you've said to me? Yeah, um, and that's the, that's the, the uh, assignment that I give to my students. Because I said if, we, if the students get an A, if they can disprove what I'm saying. And they've been trying for the last three semesters. <laughs> so, not that you can't. Because there are people who have their whole livelihood wrapped up into this gene theory. And you're not going to change the mind of those people, especially when their salaries depend upon them not believing this. All right? There's a lot of institution. Believe me, what I say sounds great and wonderful. But the devil is in the details. Because this is a very difficult thing. But you know where it's going to come from? It's going to come from folks like you. It's going to come from the people, that the consumer. The consumer is going to want it. Because you go, to, you go to Moffitt, you go to these other places, you go to uh, uh, Dana-Farber, you go to MD Anderson, you go to the Sloan Kettering, they're not going to tell you what I told you. Th but they don't prove me wrong. So, so what's going on here? All right? This is why it's a big, it's going to be a big, big something's going to happen. We, as I said to someone today, we have two choices. We can status quo, we can do it, we can go with the flow for the next hundred years. And get cancer drugs that are going to cost $100,000, and the cost is passed on to the, to the next generation and you live three or four extra months. Because don't forget, every month we have a new cure for cancer. It's in the Wall Street Journal. It's in Time Magazine. But I look at the numbers. The numbers are not changing. Now, who, well, how can you explain that? Oh, it's coming. Hope, hope, hope. I look at it differently. I see something that can possibly work and not hurt people. Oh, they say the ketogenic diet is, is harmful. To, relative to what? Temozolamide? Give me a break. Yes. Thank you. You scared the living daylights out of me with a vast and... Yeah. I um, had a melanoma in the retina, and it was too close to the line of sight vision, so they did plaque seeding in 2009 in Boston at Tufts. You know, uh, and uh, everything was great for three years. I came to Dr. Duker as the one, and it came to five years. I was cancer-free. He said, you're home. But in the past two years, my eyesight has been going down. And so I had a fluid buildup, and you uh, just said Avastin. So Avastin has been injected into my eye. Uh, now, let, let Maybe me... about seven, six, seven times now to control the fluid. And you said it's the worst drug in the world. It's the worst drug for GBM, glioblastoma multiforme. And it was pulled off the market for breast cancer. However, there are certain situations like the one you have where the therapies are shown to be much better. Okay, I gave it to you from the glioblastoma and the breast cancer angle. Okay. And because I have the data on that, but I've also seen there for some other indications, it seems to work better than some of these invasive cancers. So I, I and thank you for bringing that because I have to clear, I can clarify some of these, these issues. But is it going to do more damage than good? It's, I, I can't be sure about that. I don't think anybody can be. I'm just saying for what, for what the kinds of cancers that it, that it doesn't work well for. I can't, I'm not going to say it's, because they, they are, in fact, it is approved for certain indications. And it does, everybody does use it for those. But they use it for other indications, which I think the data clearly argues against them doing that. Is there a diet that I could do uh, that help that fluid, get rid of that fluid? 
Well, you know, you can talk to Doug, Dom D'Agostino and, and some of these other guys. I mean, none of these diets are ever harmful to your body. They're only going to help you. You know, I can't be sure. You have to monitor all this. has to be monitored. You, like we say, is it going to help me? How do I know? Well, look at the PET scans. Look at the, look at the things that happen in your body. How do you feel? You know, most of the people say, Hi, you know, how are you doing? I feel good. You know, that's, there's a lot to be said for feeling good. You know. Oh, yeah, maybe back there. Sorry. Thank you for taking the question. Um, you specified the raw vegan diet. Is there some particular rationale uh, for using that diet? Well, only because I experienced it myself. And I spoke to patients one-on-one, -on -one, a whole number of cancer patients, horrific stories. I couldn't believe it myself. But I spoke to them, and I questioned them very carefully about it. It's over here in West Palm Beach, the Hippocrates Health Institute. You know, it, it, that raw vegan diet is pretty tough to take. You know, you lose weight on it. You're chewing all day long like some farm animal. You know, the, 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 the aroma coming out of the kitchen from the raw vegan, you close the door, you go the other way. You know, but it works. It works on a lot of people, but not everybody. All right. I tried doing it, you know, it's like, okay. Uh, I only did it for three days. But if I did it for the three weeks like they told me, I'd come out probably a new evolved person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, probably as an oversimplification, if you were to take, say, the Atkins diet, which is obviously uh, promoting ketosis, how much different is yours? Is it basically just a whole lot less food on the same basic principle, or is it something different? It's a little different. The, the question is the Atkins diet. How does this differ? Because everybody talks about the Atkins. Atkins has too much protein in it. And the protein puts, puts a lot of pressure on your kidneys, and it also can be used by the liver to make glucose. So we're, we're because the Atkins diet says eat all the, the, the meat and just don't eat any carbs. You know, that's not good. Measure your, measure your glucose ketone index. If you're near, near one, I don't care what kind of diet you're on. If you're near one, your body, those tumor cells are going to be under pressure. All right? So people say, well, can I, you know, eat, you want to eat a bagel? You know, eat one bagel a week. And that's all you eat a week. You know, and then you see, you're, oh, look, at I'm doing really well. You know, you know, so, you know, it, it depends on the ratio. This is why we built the ratio so patients can know. Everybody asks, can I eat this? Can I eat that? I said, what's your ratio? Oh, I'm up near 12. You can't eat that. All right. So, yes. For one more question. No, I... Yeah, right. I guess consensus is that cancer is more prevalent in our society today rather than four or five hundred years ago with the death rate, well, in childbirth and what have you. Can, is there a correlation between periodic fasting? Because I know that in medieval days, this was a very common occurrence for people to go on periodic fast, you know, right. whether it was church-related or right. what. Absolutely. What, are your, what are your feelings about well, this? Well, I did a very a big investigation into this. I talked, to, I talked to the president of the Calorie Restriction Society of America. <laughs> and I asked him, how many people in your organization have cancer? And he and his wife that run this, they run 60 Minutes. You know, everybody sits around, they're all like stick thin, they're very thin people, and they have, a con they have their business meeting, they all sit around and share a grape. <laughs> you know. So, I asked him, what, how, he said, oh yeah, you know, John, uh, back in 1978, I think he had some cancer. But they don't have cancer. Because they're always under, they're, they're mitochondria purin. You don't get cancer unless you damage your mitochondria. And these people under these fasting conditions, they have low glucose and high ketones, they're in that ketotic, in that zone. Very few people on the planet can do that. All right? You've got to be like somebody different. I mean, you go into a pizza shop, your knees become weak. I mean, you're not going to be doing this, you know. You have to know how to balance this stuff up. But there are people that are extremists like this. 
And they don't have, your answer's right, they don't have cancer. All this stuff came when we changed the Food and Drug Administration labels in the early 80s, and we got all this high fructose corn syrup into the food chain, and now we're getting the infl body inflammation, all these chronic diseases, dementia, Parkinson's, all this stuff is all related to the same thing, which is called, now how do you prevent? Prevention is a different issue. I have a big section in my book on prevention. Nobody cares, not many people care about prevention. I get cancer, what are you gonna do for me now? Well, you should have done this. Well, I'm not doing that. All right, so, so now what do you do? It's a, it's, a whole, it's a whole thing about looking at this. But you can prevent, but you have to kind of change it. And, and the food industry doesn't help us. We're not using natural stuff here. Everything is like, people are on the run all the time. I've got to come home, let me eat this stuff, eat that. You don't have time to sit down and do all this. And it's putting ourselves at risk. We're putting ourselves at risk. It's us. It's the food industry and us. And with that, let's thank our speaker. <laughs> Thank you. My thanks to IHMC for permission to broadcast this video. Thanks as well to the staff at RCTV. Also to you, thanks for watching. Until next time, I'm Bruce Cooper.